How do you know if your neighbor is a dark magician? What came first, chickens, eggs, or greys? Answers to these questions and more on this episode of This Paranormal Life. Hey! Oh! Welcome back to This Paranormal Life. This is the podcast where every Tuesday we dissect a different paranormal claim, tale, case, and get to the bottom of whether it is true or whether it is false. And as always, you are joined by myself, Kit Greer, professional paranormal investigator, and also joined by my co-host, amateur paranormal investigator, Mr. Rory Powers. Welcome, everyone, to the podcast. I'm extra excited about this one. Oh, yeah? I feel like it's going to be a, it's a lively one, so I've brought my collection of daggers Whoa. into the studio just in case things start to pop off. Yeah, well, I mean... Things haven't really popped off in all 75 previous episodes. You think today could be the day? All I've learned from my years of being a professional paranormal investigator is that you never know when you're going to need a dagger. Right. The last time you utilized a dagger got you put away for a pretty decent amount of time. Yeah. So. And I was just making toast. It ended up with three severely wounded. Yeah. I'm really bad at using daggers. Somehow I was on the jury for that. And honestly, it was such an open and shut case. I had to send you down for that one. Fair enough. I hope you respect that. I absolutely do. Now, as always, we're not going to dilly-dally around. We're going to dive right into today's tale. Daggers at the ready. Let's go. You don't have to hold it to my throat, but... I said let's go. It's 1931 on the Isle of Man. On a hill lay a farmhouse home to the Irving family. Jim, Margaret, and their daughter, Voiry. Back in 1931 on the Isle of Man, it was not a given that you had electricity and telephones and so on. So you can imagine that one night, by the light of lamp, they heard scratching and knocking. It sounded like it was coming from behind the walls. Blasted rats, Jim thought, and he banged on the wall, hoping to scare it away. F*** off, rats. Not tonight. <laughs> it's f***ing bingo night. No f***ing scratching on bingo night. He's got his daggers out. He's just shanking the walls randomly, trying to spear one of these little boys. He sits back down, but it's not long before the noise starts up again. Ignore it for tonight. I'll, I'll catch him tomorrow. Let's go to bed. I, I'm going to, just to set the scene, I'm going to show you a uh, picture of the Irving family. Okay. <laughs> Whoa, what the hell is that? Is that an actual picture of them? That is an actual picture. I mean, it looks like it's come from a Sega Mega Drive. I mean, it is. That's Sonic Knuckles and Tails. Oh, this is the wrong photo. What right. about this? Oh, f that's Castlevania. Hold on. Right. What about this? Uh, this is very creepy. They almost look like mannequins uh, set in an old-timey old timey setting. Yeah, so thank you for moving past the unbelievably pixelated nature of this picture. But what we can see is three family members sitting around very solemnly, almost as if they're conducting a seance. Yeah. So the next day, he sets traps. But nothing. Whatever this was just wouldn't bite. Maybe like a cat or dog would scare them away, right? So Jim leans up to the wall and starts growling like a dog to trick this thing. There is a pause. And then he hears growling right back at him. Whoa, dogs in the walls? I've been there, brother. It's an expensive pass control task. That's the last thing you want is, you know, if, if you wake up and you're like, do I have like bed bugs or something? And you look down at your <laughs> legs and there's just full on like gnawed limbs. You call in the pest guy and he's like, uh, we're going to have to tent the place up, gas it, come back in about seven days. That's not what you want to do. Uh, by the looks of the scratch marks on the um, uh, plaster wall here, it looks like you've got seven or eight wolves just really running about inside there. Uh, wolves are incredibly expensive to feed. You know, if you want to keep their coats glossy, you're talking a couple hundred bucks a month exactly. uh, dog food. So um, I don't know if you guys want to gas them, if you want to look after them. It's all on you. It, choice is yours, but all I'm saying is the gas is running. It's running right now. <laughs> so, the, so the choice isn't ours. The gas is running. If you don't put on this mask, uh, I don't know how much longer you're going to be alive to think about this. So so I just say, you know, make sure you don't take too long to think about it. A wolf comes out wearing a gas mask and rips his arm up. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't see this coming. This is the first time it's ever happened. Forgot to mention that uh, nine out of ten times the gas will hyper evolve the beast and make them super intelligent. But with those odds, who, who could have seen this one happening? 
<laughs> you're like, wait, why did we trust this guy? You go on his Yelp review. It's like, he got all, he's got five stars. You check all the reviews. <laughs> They're all written by wolves. He's trained the wolves to give him Yelp reviews. So Jim tries a different sign to try and scare it off. Meow. And what does he get back later? A, a, a meow. Yeah. What? No matter what he tries, this thing mimics it right back. He's got dittos in the wall. It got to the point that whatever animal noise he tried, the thing behind the wall did the same back. At this point, he's doing goddamn parakeet cause. <laughs> he tried a freaking bobcat. Row! This thing row! right back at him. Jim must have felt like he was losing his mind at this point. But the craziest was yet to come. Because if this thing could make any noise it wanted, what if it could talk? God. The youngest, Voiry, wanted to try something. What if I do a nursery rhyme? Could it do that back? Sure enough, the inhuman squeaky voice behind the wall was rhyming off the hits. Twinkle, twinkle, humpty dumpty, the works. Oh my god. The Irvings looked at each other and summoned the courage to ask, Who are you? The creature said its name was Jeff. <laughs> what I was expecting. <laughs> so he's like, he's beyond just repeating stuff now. He's just having, a, it's just a man in the wall having a full on conversation with them. Jeff said that he was a mongoose, but not just a mongoose, but quote, an extra, extra clever mongoose. So many questions. Yep. My God. Hi. When did you get here? I was born in <laughs> India. Jesus Christ. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to get used to this voice, aren't I? I did a lot of research, and um, by all estimations, this was more or less how Jeff sounded. I studied so. his vocal cords. I know this is exactly how he sounded. I actually spent a lot of the last couple of weeks uh, living with a uh, flock of mongies. Uh, Mongai, I believe, is the plural. Apologies. I studied the way that they vocalized, the way that they lived, breeded, <laughs> defecated. You actually used that that uh, wolf gas on the herd to make them hyper evolve to the point where they could actually speak. Brother Kit, thank you for evolving our species. <laughs> what can we do to repay you? Just take me to prom. <laughs> you roll up to prom out of the limo <laughs> with you in a tux and these <laughs> like this absolute horde of mongai. Mongai. Just in a trench coat, like removing <laughs> as a blob, just, <laughs> just like twitching and like writhing from all the movement of all the mongies. You walk out to like the quarterback on the football team, and you're like, "Well, Chad, looks like I found a date after all." It's like, <laughs> as a flock of mongies, we, we can all see it. She's brunette, though. <laughs> at least, wait till you hear her angelic voice. That's right, Chad. <laughs> Oh my god, it's it's literally cutting through my ears. <laughs> I get my first kiss, also my first rabies. <laughs> yeah, so Jeff speaks. I was born in India, in Delhi, in 1852. And whilst this did sound mental, there was a local farmer on the Isle of Man who had kept mongoose around. So they did exist somewhere on the island. Huh. But why could he talk? Well, he wasn't just a mongoose, it seemed like. He described himself as an earthbound spirit, a ghost in the form of a mongoose. He also said, I am a freak. <laughs> <laughs> I have hands and I have feet. If you saw me, you would faint. So you'd, he's human. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned into a stone, a pillar of salt. <laughs> So, so definitely don't try and get in here. Don't try and take me out. I look like a human. And if you see me, I, I, I will look like a human. But don't look at me. Insane. <laughs> well, not only did Jeff start talking, but he kind of wouldn't shut up. He would talk to Voiry and Jim regularly, but less Margaret. He didn't like Margaret very much. And he would live in this little boxed off partition in the house that they called Jeff's Sanctum. But he mostly liked showing himself to Voiry. Jim and Margaret only caught glimpses from time to time. She said that he was like, quote, a small rat with a flat snout like a hedgehog and yellow fur with a long tail. Oh, wow. So they can they can actually see him. Yeah. So Jim and Margaret got glimpses here and there enough to know he was real. Okay. But Voiry was the one who really the, the child basically really hung out with um, Jeff. 
From that description, yellow fur, long tail, flat snout, small rat, sounds like a Pikachu. I'll say it right now. Yeah, absolutely. And not only would he not shut up, but he became so much a part of the family they couldn't escape him. Jim would complain that they literally couldn't even whisper in the house without Jeff butting in. <laughs> he would sing too. He knew the Manx national anthem. Carolina Moon was his favourite song, and he knew hymns. He even knew a Spanish song, and he <laughs> and a quote dirty parody of Home on the Range. Oh God! With his own lyrics. <laughs> I have to know what that is. I searched for dirty Home on the Range sex parody. And I'm being served a lot of porn. So if anyone feel, if any amateur paranormal investigator out there feels like reconstructing the uh, parody Home in the Range lyrics that Jeff might have used, please feel free to do so. Jeff would basically head out first thing in the morning and run around town for a bit. Apparently he would hitch on the back of cars and trailers and then return home with stories of what he had been up to, who he had been talking to and whatever the latest scandal was. Would he talk to hu other humans or, or other rats? I think <laughs> It's a good question. I think he was more roaming around overhearing conversations and then talking shit about those people to Jim, Margaret and Boyery. Wow. Yeah. What a little asshole. Sometimes he would even bring back rabbits he had killed for the family to cook. And he watched over the family too. The Irvings claimed that he would guard the house from unknown visitors or unknown dogs. He would extinguish <laughs> fires that people forgot to put out at night. And he would wake people up whenever they overslept. And even scare mice away. And in return, they would leave out, you know, bananas, biscuits and chocolate for him. Just having painted you the immediate picture of Jeff's arrival. Thoughts? So are they pretty, are they living, like, coexisting pretty peacefully? Yes. Okay. Up to this point. <laughs> okay. I'm looking forward to the future of this story, because it sounds like you'd be a bit of a pain in the ass. Benevolent, but kind of annoying member of the family. Yeah. You know, you'd just be, like, at the dinner table, and you'd be like, yeah, it's like, it's weirdly cloud cloudy today. I couldn't, what was that? Yeah. I was just talking to my wife. Just trying to, yeah. It wasn't really uh, much to do with, I just... You know, no one said shit about the rabbit I brought home today. That was a big, that was a big one. Yeah, and it was really f***ing hard because it's roadkill. So, thanks, I guess. Yeah, well, you didn't say thanks for putting out for me putting out the fire either last night. Yeah, I mean, it was a you lazy bastards fell asleep. Wow, my house. It was a tiny fire. Yeah, it was a god. It was a volcano yeah, down here to you because you're a tiny f mongoose. <laughs> I just think he would. You probably get on my nerves. Yeah. But it's so weird because it sounds a lot like, uh, like we talked about previously with Corny, the Irish ghost. Yeah. A voice, a disembodied voice in the halls, in the walls. Uh, but they never saw Corny. And you're saying that they were seeing this little Pikachu rat running around the place. Yeah. I mean, the parents are seeing him, like, as I say, just enough to know something's going on. Yeah. Uh, they haven't, like, you know, he's not, like, perched on their shoulder like Polly the parrot. But... They have seen him running around, and Voyery uh, seems to see him all the time. Fair play to this family for not just bashing him day one. Yeah, because if I, you know, if I see any creature in this flat, they would be they would be bashed immediately. Yeah, that's how I deal with it. That's my pest control. Whenever there's so much as a a loose centipede in our flat, you insist on calling pest control, and I always go, Rory. You're calling your second phone. We know you're calling yourself. And then you pick up the other phone and go, hello, yeah, it's me again. And then you put on sunglasses and you start gassing. We have to leave. Yeah. Because it's toxic. Yeah. The, uh, the one time I actually did call a guy from pest control, he showed up and I just said, watch this. And started bashing the bugs uh, myself. It was more of like a, like a, a bragging thing. Yeah. Be like, oh, uh, thanks for your service. Um, thanks for bringing all your equipment and, and spending, you know, the time to get out here. Could you do me a quick favor and f off while I handle it? Ugh! I started bashing the yeah. walls. I do that a lot. Like, I'll order, like, a pizza yeah. while I'm halfway d done, like, cooking a pizza in the oven. Yeah. So then they'll show up and they're like, oh, I got a pepperoni. You put a lot like, of effort in as well. Like, they spent probably 15 <laughs> minutes on your pizza. You spent most of the day days I creating, the, like, a Napoli-style authentic pizza. From I built the stone oven in the kitchen mm -hmm. to I cook noticed. it all. Yeah, you deconstructed the rest of the kitchen to do it, so... I and definitely like, noticed. Oh, I got a pepperoni pizza for Roy Powers. And I'm like, oh, I think that's for me. Could you do me a quick favor and f 
fuck off. I got a pizza in the oven. Slam the door in their faces. <laughs> it's weird because you still have to pay. Like the pest control guy, he's a call out fee. Yeah, they charge me more as well because of the time wasted. Yeah. And I have to obviously get a new pizza place every single time. Yeah, because they keep learning. Yeah. yeah. I really hope you drop that. I mean, if you ever need surgery, God forbid, or something <laughs> like that. So that's how I handle my problems. Right. Uh, uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, this story definitely takes the horror movie, paranormal activity style movie incidents of, you know, something unnatural happening in the house and everyone watching always goes, oh, just move out. Like, there's obvious things you would do. It's always kind of crazy when you hear about these stories, these true stories like Corny, like this one, that, yeah, the people actually do, like in the movies, they kind of stay put. They try to live, live with it live through it hopefully they just they're just kind of praying that any day it'll just end and then go back to normal life yeah but it's funny that they're just kind of getting on with it yeah i guess best case scenario you have some sort of ratatouille s- situation where he just climbs up in your hat and teaches you how to cook that's very true um and he did say he was extra extra clever like yeah you know. in between very raunchy verses of home on the range he yeah. mentioned that yeah whenever you talk about like a dirty version of home on the range i just think of that like that one kid that everyone knows from school, kind of needy and a bit nerdy and doesn't have that many friends. So they learn rude versions of songs yeah. to sing to people because they think that'll like get them friends. But everyone's like, that dude, that's just a weird thing to do. Yeah, no one wants to hear your weird sex version of Home on the Range. You know, Jim and Margaret are like 60. They're like, this isn't really. Yeah, there's our a kid thing. in the room. Yeah. And he's like, we don't appreciate it. It's this. really funny though. You should hear the course. Sex, sex on the range. Not that clever. <laughs> Not that clever, doesn't rhyme. Feel doesn't like sound you just made it like. up, yeah. <laughs> Where the penises are all in vajays. Really, really not clever. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't be laughing at this, because this is exactly what we it's said actually was cl- beneath it's us. It's actually clever as shit. It's actually awesome. <laughs> I feel more popular now that I said it as well, which is dope. <laughs> Better put some music out of that. <laughs> A 19th century Indian mongoose singing <laughs> dirty version of Home on the Range. Woo! <sighs> yeah, this is immediately uh, one of the most bizarre stories we've featured. Well, bit of an inconvenience, but things were otherwise pretty peachy. But it wasn't long until Jeff started exhibiting other behavior. It wasn't all just bringing home dead rabbits for everyone to eat and singing inappropriate songs. Sometimes he made the Irvings question their own safety. Ooh. After all, if he decided to stop protecting them, stop putting out those fires at night, keeping away unknowns from the door, how could they stop him? They've become too dependent on him. You need me <laughs> more than I need you, me thinks. It's not Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> One night, Foyeri was getting scared of all the crazy noises Jeff was making and wanted to stay in her parents' room when Jeff threatened, quote, I'll follow her wherever you put her. Oh, like in the walls? I guess. Jeez. And Jim's like, bad, fine. Where did this come from? Yeah. And Jim and Margaret literally went to the lengths of boarding up their bedroom door with heavy objects so that they could be sure nothing would get in. And they could hear Jeff smashing against the corners of the door trying to get in. God. At other times, he would yell worrying dark things like, I'll split the atom! I am the fifth dimension! I am the eighth wonder of the world! Or, I am not evil. I could be if I wanted. (laughs) You don't know what damage or harm I could do if I were roused. I could kill you all! But I won't. Look, when you back someone into a corner, they always show their true colors. And I feel like that's what they've done here. They've, well, they haven't backed, they've backed themselves into a corner. But equally, the message is there. Right. He's exposed himself as a lunatic mongoose. And it was always there dormant. Now (laughs) they've activated it. Yeah. When they asked him where he would go when he died, he said, (laughs) To hell! (laughs) To the land of mist! I'm not evil. Where were you going when you die? Definitely hell. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely hell. <laughs> okay. You want to qualify that? <laughs> where the dicks <laughs> and ball swing. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't want another rabbit. <laughs> They're like all nervously laughing. <laughs> Where do you go when you die? I came here. <laughs> <laughs> so when I started investigating this case, and thank you to uh, Lee for suggesting this all the way back in, in January and for David suggesting it more recently. Um, thank you, guys. I thought this was going to be... This sounded so crazy. I thought this was going to be a um, simple, quick case right. for us to investigate. Little did I know, that's not the case. And mm. that's why this is going to be a two-parter, people. Oh, my God. This is just part one of the story. And now it is a great time for us to call it quits and come back to this next week. Exactly. We thought, because, you know, we thought we'll do one little episode about this family who saw a mongoose. That's it. Now the thing is saying it's going to hell when it dies. And that is a whole nother episode where we need to find out why. We need to find the rest of those verses to the parody sex song. There's a lot of stuff that we need to get. Got, in we we got to practice uh, versions of this Home on the Range tune um, before next time for us to accurately, you know, play it on the podcast. I got to order a pizza for Christ's sake. Yeah. So I hope you guys are enjoying the story of Jeff so far. And <clears throat> and you guys got to tune back in on Tuesday for part two of this tale. But before we go, we always have to do our Patreon shout outs. Thank you to everyone who's pledged so far. Special thanks to the guys we're going to shout out right here and now on the podcast. So special thank you to Robin Howe. How do you sleep at night? Aren't there Robin folks like that? Nice. But I like your style. Robin from the rich given to the paranormal peasants. So thanks for c- chucking a couple bucks in the buckets of the paranormal peasants. Really appreciate it. Thank you also to Kevin Turner. Turner? I barely know her. <laughs> There needs to be more than that. (laughs) Turner the Burner. The man who has the most phones in the shortest amount of time. That's right. Because he covers his track. There's no paper trail. There's no phone trail. He sent he sends you a text, and when you text him back, deadline. That's right. He's moved on to another phone. He's the most antisocial person of all time. It's yeah, it's actually really it's really hard to keep in touch with him. So this is good to hear from him again. I think it's been twenty five years actually since the last message. Because he phoned me once right. and then snapped that phone and thought I was going to get back to him. Yeah. I, I didn't have his number. I didn't know wh- why he thought I would have his number. Sometimes it's just like, hey, bro, uh, you know, just wanted to extend the invite to my um, wedding. So if you could just RSVP, that would be good. Snap. Gr- Maybe see him again in a couple of years. You're not going to get anything from that guy. It's crazy. Anyway, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Kevin. Thank you also. To Rune Bang Jacobson. Rune the Spoon. On those spooky paranormal nights, he's always behind me, coddling me like the man baby I am, keeping me safe, and I appreciate it, brother or sister. No judgment here, brother or sister. Uh, thank you also to Raziel Blanco. I played Russian roulette against her one time. Thought we were firing Blancos, but we were actually firing bullets. <laughs> Luckily, the man to my left of me died before I did. So we took his wallet, we took his money, and guess what? I took his identity. That's right. That man was Rory Powers. Holy crap. And the other man that died that night? Blanco. What? That's right, we took two identities and we left for the hills. Oh, that makes sense, actually. That's a crazy story, and actually, Raziel has itemized all of it in their uh, email to us when they joined. He mentioned, cool, I'm glad he remembers it. Yeah. He's actually blackmailing you, now that I see it. Yeah, he's actually threatening the authorities on you. For the murder, that makes a lot of sense. Moving on. Thank you also to James Science. James, you don't need to be a science teacher to understand the paranormal, all right? You need a degree in the class of life. And you, get, you don't get that by studying in a class. You get that when Bigfoot walks up and happy slaps you. That's life experience. I'll tell you what, whenever Bigfoot happy slaps you, there's a good chance that shit will never work again. <laughs> Absolutely not. If it's not blown clean off. No shame, brother, but what I'm saying is get out of that laboratory and go find Bigfoot. Thanks also to John Gretberg Engdahl. 
Ah, John, or as we know him, you'll remember this, you know, John the Lawn? Oh, yeah. The guy that's out at the, our front lawn literally every day in every the tinfoil hat. It's insane. Shouting the names of various cryptids out our bedroom windows at midnight. Yeah. He's a good guy. I, we, a good guy. Love I, can't, common. I can't believe that he even has an internet connection, to be honest with you. Let alone money to be able to give it. But we appreciate the support, brother. Uh, I hope the lawn is treating you well. <laughs> Because the sprinklers aren't. <laughs> We'd let you in, but shit, buddy, we don't want to. Thank you, John. Thank you also, lastly, but not leastly, this week to Richard Morris. Ah, uh, Richard. Truly an expert in Morse code. Trying to code this, Richard. It says thanks, Richard. <laughs> For helping us on Patreon. Could and a winky you. emoji. <laughs> Accidentally said f*** off. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said thanks. Thank you very much, Richard, for supporting us on Patreon. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you to everyone we shouted out this episode. And everyone we are yet to shout out. There are some people we just haven't got around to just yet. But we are getting there episode by episode. Thanks for being so patient, everyone. Truly couldn't do it without you. Hope everyone's enjoying um, their Patreon hood and enjoying every episode. Join us next week for part two of this truly terrifying paranormal tale. And until then, remember to live fast, die young. Oh, shit. I got it wrong this time. I was going to do it anyway, so I'm glad you you did it. What? Deliberately? (laughs) What? No. Live live fast, fast, investigate, investigate, and and die die young. young.